all that I knew was that I needed to be better the second time, but I didn't know what to do yeah. to improve my application exactly. Like Mission Accepted, Season 1, Episode 3. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let's talk about your application cycle. You're in the middle of it now, so thanks for coming on and sharing some time. You've had a very successful application cycle. Before we jump in and, and look at your AMCAS application, I want to hear from you kind of your thoughts on why you have been so successful. Yeah, um, so this is my second time applying, and I kind of tried to learn from the mistakes that time as much as I could. And one thing I applied really early, I think I submitted my application a couple of days after AMCAS opened. Mm -hmm. And then I also worked as an EMT, so I was able to talk a lot about that experience. And then I also took your advice as best as I could and tried to write stories, like not only in my personal statement, but for each extracurricular description and just really tell my story, apply early, and finish my secondaries on time. <laughs> <laughs> so everything I say to do, um, <laughs> you you have had multiple acceptances this year. It's your second application cycle. What happened the first application cycle? Did, did you have interviews and wait lists, or what, what happened that first time around? Yeah, so the first time, I only applied to four schools. So that's another thing I did this time, too. I applied to a total of, like, 28 schools, I think, okay. around that. Um, so the first time I only applied to four schools, um, also later in the cycle, um, and I ended up getting one interview, then I got waitlisted at that school and never got pulled off the waitlist. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And so that was uh, 2016 was the first time I applied. Okay. Uh, all right. So a little bit of a, of a delay between f last application and this application. What what was the thought process between waiting so long between application cycles? And did you get feedback from the, the previous cycle that you had some some issues with your application that you took time to fix? What what was that like? So the reason it took so long is really just having no idea what to do next. Uh, all that I knew was that I needed to be better the second time, but I didn't know what to do yeah. to improve my application exactly. Like eventually after a few years, it's like, oh, like I have an EMT certification. I just need to work as an EMT. And it kind of worked out from there. But after that cycle, I had just graduated college. I started working as like a lab technician and I just didn't know what to do about my grades. My GPA wasn't great. Um, so I ended up doing a post back, but then like financially I couldn't continue. So then once I only did two quarters of my post back, it's like, well, that's what I was supposed to do to improve, but I can't continue. I feel like two quarters looks bad. I just didn't know what to do from there. I just worked as a nanny for a while. And then working as an EMT is where I finally like, I found you, <laughs> I found your advice, read all your books, watched all your YouTube videos. And then it became more clear on what I needed to do, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as feedback from the first time, I did not take advantage of that, even though I got an email saying, we'll go over your application with you. And I was like, well, my GPA is low. So yeah. Okay. That wasn't a idea on my yeah. Step yeah. one, always, always get that feedback. The, the yeah. more, uh, the more interactions that you can have with those people who are potentially making decisions, the, the better. So yeah. Uh, well, good. I'm, I'm glad everything is working out for you. And let's go ahead and dive into your application and, and see what we can learn from it. So starting out, uh, obviously, you said you applied early. We can see that um, June 3rd with the June 22nd processing date. I think it was episode one of, of Mission Accepted. The student applied June seventh or eighth, and their their process date was like July twentieth. It was like a whole month later, wow. just because they submitted their application uh, a few days later. At the end of the day, I will tell you that um, for the majority of of people, that June twenty second date versus July twenty second date is not that big of a difference. Um, because uh, just the the way s schools are processing data and, and waiting for stuff to come in and waiting for secondaries, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, assuming that it sounds like what you did, you got your secondaries done early. For that student earlier who whose process date wasn't until July 20th or 21st, whatever it was, as long as they um, 
they pre-wrote their secondaries, they can turn those secondaries around pretty quickly and, and still be just as, just as, uh, perfectly timed in terms of the application timing. So good job getting it in early. Your application here, nothing really standing out a ton. You have, this is uh, something that stands out to me as I'm just looking at it, uh, post 9-11 GI Bill, but I didn't see. Oh, it's because my mom. Yeah, I was going to say, you must have a parent who was able to transfer it to you. Um, it, it stinks. I, I didn't serve long enough to be able to transfer it to my kids. And so oh. I, I have this like GI bill. I'm like, I don't want to go to school anymore. What am I going to do with it? <clears throat> um, but that's a bummer. Um, so that's well, great. I'm too old now. Oh, really? Yeah. It's it, uh, once you're 26, even though I haven't used it all, um, once you're 26, you can't use it anymore and I'll start when I'm 26. Oh, that's a bummer. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's, that's, oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So we, we see that stand out. Um, you have uh, parent guardian information. Uh, this is something I always like to point out because students always ask where this comes from. This usually comes from um, straight from here. And so seeing your parents not have a four-year degree is most likely where that comes from. But okay. that's, that's, where I, that's where I think it comes from. Uh, uh, in terms of that, this is automatically generated and isn't tied to, right, putting disadvantage here. Um, institutional action, I've, I've talked about this previously, right? It's it's so common for students to have institutional actions when it comes to alcohol. Uh, that's just the, the kind of American rite of passage. You go to college and, and you start drinking and sometimes you get in trouble, which is a bummer. Um, uh, so I, I think you did a great job marking yes obviously what you had to do uh but then what you learned from it right owning it and say look this happened it, it helped me be more mature pretty simple straightforward thing um it, it doesn't hold students back so many students fear like their their career is over because of this institutional action for something like alcohol it's just it's not an issue uh, assuming you own up to it in your your description um then we get to a lot of C's. Yeah, we get we get to uh, dual enrollment, which I don't understand dual enrollment. I, I I don't think I knew anything about it when I was in high school. I just, I see so many students like start off college on the wrong foot because of dual enrollment from high school, yeah. thinking it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to do it because it's offered. And it'll it'll help me financially, which is where the decision usually lies. Um, but then those grades, students don't think the grades matter in dual enrollment, and they do because they end yeah. up on your transcript, um, which is a bummer. So kind of digging yourself a hole early on, and then freshman year continuing that with lots of C's and B's. Um, talk about that that journey in terms of of your courses and and the grades. What what happened there? Yeah, so I'd say the two biggest reasons for that. One, um, I was undecided and I rode horses growing up. So I was on an equestrian team and I had my own horses. And like I chose to go from Ohio to Mississippi because I wanted to ride in college. So like the team was my thing and I was undecided. I had no idea what I wanted to do after college. Um, and plus, I was working as a waitress at our local um, restaurant near my college yep. and so I was working 20 to 30 hours a week doing that that was the main reason but of course I had three lessons a week plus we went out of town for horse shows four weekends a semester so all that on top of classes just yeah it's <laughs> such a common story athletics right being on the equestrian team other responsibilities with work and then just being undecided with with what you wanted to do with your life and so you're yeah. you're living in the moment which is perfectly fine, but the future you is like, darn it, like, why did you do yeah. that? Because now I'm struggling, I'm paying more to go back to post back classes, uh, but it's such a common story, especially for students who don't come into college knowing what they wanna do and not working toward that future. You're just living in the moment having fun, which is great, but sometimes there are consequences. Yeah. <laughs> Um, cool. All right. So we, we get that when, let me ask you, when did that switch come to go? Oh, like I want to be a doctor. When was that in your journey? Yeah. So I would say going into college, 
it was, I'm obviously going to do math or science. Like that's what I liked most in high school. But beyond that, I didn't know. And then sophomore year is where it was finally like I'm halfway through college almost. And I still don't, I'm still undecided. I was working a lot. It was like six or seven nights a week that I was working as a waitress. Um, and I just got to the point where like all my friends were like having fun. I had terrible grades. All I was doing was working. Um, and I was just like, I need to decide on something. Like I'm very goal oriented. Mm. I'm not working towards anything. Like I love the equestrian team, but after college, I was not going to have anything to do. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of just like that culmination. I like still remember sitting in my dorm room and like, okay, like I'm going to start like researching careers, figuring out what I want to do. And then I really just picked my major chemistry with the pre-med track because I liked chemistry in high school and um, the pre-med classes at my college, we had like histology, medical physiology, gross anatomy. So the classes were just really exciting to me. Yeah. Um, and then that following summer, I was able to shadow. So those two things led me to pre-med. Did you ever, did, did the thought ever cross your mind to go into to veterinary medicine because of your equestrian background? So it's interesting because not really because I had horses growing up, our vet, um, <laughs> turned you off. I, Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, now that I think about, about it, like the reasons are like the same reasons I'm going to be dealing with when I'm a resident. <laughs> so it doesn't really make much sense, but <laughs> So I, I don't know. I probably would have enjoyed that too, but yeah. I just, my view of my vet that I had growing up, I was like, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. So you, you were exposed to vet, vet medicine. You're like, nope, that's not for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> understandable. All right. So we continue on at sophomore year, still with some of those grades. And then I think we, we kind of see this switch, as you said, kind of sophomore year going, what am I doing? I don't know. And then we get into more of these science classes, um, getting A's and B's, um, really making that, that switch and doing well. Um, senior year, a little, a little hiccup there. Oh, that, that hurts a five credit class, uh, with a C that's, that's a painful one. Yeah. Um, senior but, year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then A is the rest of the time. So that's, that's, uh, for the most part, really good. And then your post back classes here at East Bay. Um, again, the idea for, for most students is as, as much as possible, as close to a 4.0 as possible for someone, especially like you kind of trying to dig yourself out of a hole. Um, and then coming into your post back, having some, some B pluses, a B here, uh, not specifically ideal, but it is what it is. And then you said you, you couldn't finish the post back in terms of all the classes that you wanted to take. Um, East Bay, um, East Bay, from my recollection, because I know students who have been there, that's a formal post back program, correct? Yeah. Okay. And so you, you left at some point without completing that program. A lot of students are, are afraid of what that looks like on an application. It doesn't look like anything. It just looks like you didn't finish it, which is perfectly fine. Um, so good job with your post back. As we look at your, your grades here, so um, kind of the, the high school grades coming in here, that's from the, the dual enrollment uh, kind of going up a little bit freshman year, a little bit more sophomore year. And then you can see junior, senior year picking it up with a little bit of a dip there, senior year because of that that five credit C that <laughs> that hurts. Um, it's one one class can destroy you uh, when it's when it counts for that many credits. Um, and then again picking it back up in your post back, and you were still able, even though you didn't finish it, you were still able to get a, a decent amount of credits in there. And and so. Um, just a, a nice way for for this to be laid out. You can see your your post back undergraduate being counted towards your your cumulative undergraduate grade. Um, so not not an outstanding kind of final GPA there three three one, but decent upward trend once you figured out um, what you wanted to do and where you were going. In your application in, in secondaries, were you able to talk about those early struggles GPA-wise and, and finding your path? And do you think that potentially helped explain away the, the lower GPA? Yeah, um, I don't know that I, I did it if they have a specific question, like some said, explain anything lower than B minus or something like that. And so with those essays, basically the same thing I told you, I was working as a waitress and it took me a while to decide. Um, but then once I, 
chose my major. Um, yeah, I did. I don't know how exactly I put it, but something yeah. along those lines. <laughs> yep. That's exactly right. Just, just tell the story. Tell the truth is, is what I, um, students always ask, like, what am I supposed to say here? I'm like, tell the truth. What happened? Yeah. Um, and then we get to MCAT and you crushed the MCAT. Why, why do you think you were so successful with the MCAT? Obviously 509, the first time is still really good score. Uh, I'm interested to know why you retook it. Oh, well, it, the score expired. That's why. Yeah. Um, and, cool. and, and what, what was the difference between that 516 and 509? Yeah, um, so I was really happy with the first time. That was my motivation. It was like, like do well first time, you know, have to take, never have to take it again. And that ended up not really being true. But um, I was terrified. I like heard all the stories of people like studying for a long time and getting like less than a 500. So I was terrified of it. And that was a good motivator. Yeah. Um, I also just like, I don't know, I like standardized tests and I was studying by myself. I had no work. Um, it was the entire summer, just every day, wake up, go to the library, eight to two to four o'clock study. Um, and I just had a very like straightforward plan. I took occasional practice tests. And then, um, when it came around to the second time, one, I had taken more like upper, upper level classes, even though I got to see in med phys, but you know, I still took like histology and anatomy and physiology and things I hadn't had before. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also I still remembered like the first time I took the test, I didn't finish three of the sections. Like I ran out of time wow. and guessed on a lot. Yeah. And I thought I bombed it because of that. So I knew that the second time I really needed to focus on timing and make sure I finish all the sections. Um, and then the other thing was more passage based practice. Um, I just didn't, that was probably part of the timing thing too. Like I, I knew I had just needed a little bit more of that the second yeah. time around. So, well, obviously shows in that score going up. So great, great MCAT score that potentially, and I don't like to talk about, uh, MCAT score, like getting an MCAT score, helping kind of offset a lower GPA, but it just, it, reassures the admissions committee that you hopefully won't have any problems when it comes to the other standardized tests that that are in your future in terms of boards and and everything else so uh great job with that mcat all right and then let's get into your activities here so um, uh, obviously being an applicant this year with this little thing called COVID, uh, yeah. potentially throwing a wrench into some of your activities and we'll, we'll see where, where that comes into play if at all. Um, so a little bit of a, a, of an experience here in, um, February and March of this year, just as a, as a tutor, uh, which is great. Uh, the storytelling, right? See you again next week, of course, talking about one specific student, right? An eight-year-old girl jumping with excitement. To me, this this type of writing is just, it's such a relief for me to, to be able to see you interacting, to picture you interacting as you're writing the story instead of you just saying, I have really great communication skills and I am a good leader through being a tutor, right? That's, <laughs> that's what most students do when they write these. And when you tell the story, I just see so much more about who you are. Um, it's such a relief for, for the reviewer. Um, did you get any feedback at, as you went on your, your interview trail and everything else, any feedback on your style of writing and, and how you were able to communicate all these things? Um, no, I got like specific questions about certain experiences or a certain like thing that I said, yeah. but not about like how I wrote it. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Um, so being an EMT, obviously a huge, a uh, huge thing here, starting it a little bit later, um, starting it in December, kind of right before you are getting ready to apply, projecting out. Uh, obviously, being an EMT during this time is is kind of useful because we still need EMTs even during COVID. I'm assuming you're you're still working as an EMT now. I just uh, quit because we went through a shift rebid, and I didn't want to do nights. <laughs> okay, that's a bummer. Um, I was I was trying to stay on and do part time, but it was taking too long, and I got other jobs so I can start saving up. So okay. All righty. Um, projecting out time, projecting out hours, uh, obviously a good amount of hours to, to look at there. Um, and then, uh, again, the storytelling, right? Um, I was sitting in the back of the ambulance with my first real patient fumbling with the 
blood pressure cuff as I wrapped it around his arm. So you uh, are are really just pointing out these stories and pointing out who you are instead of saying, as an EMT, we go on calls to help people, right? It, obviously, 99.9% .9 of people looking at your application are going to know what an EMT is. And so I don't need you to waste space telling me what an EMT is. I don't need you to waste my time doing that. I want to see you and your impact and kind of your journey in this. And I think you did a, a great job with that. Um, right, again, just the, the storytelling aspect, making our way through a maze of elevators. Right, again, I can just picture this and see it, which is great. So really, really good writing here. Um, uh, obviously, I'm going a little bit fast through these. Uh, if you're watching this on on YouTube, you can pause and read and, and kind of get a good understanding of what's going on here. Um, again, as we as we continue on, so you have caregiver for a nanny, uh, caregiver nanny for quadriplegic mother. It's it's interesting. Um, were you a caregiver for the mom, or were you more a nanny for the kids? I was both. Yeah. I, I did it all. Yeah. And so and so you potentially could have marked this or maybe even split it up into two. One yeah. one being clinical experience, being a caretaker for the mom, and then one being a nanny for the kids. Um oh. it's it's something that a lot of students don't really understand. <clears throat> being a caretaker, right? The, the, if you Google clinical experiences in the AAMC. The AAMC says caretaking is, is clinical experience, um, whether it's for your own family member or for someone else. Um, and so for that, I would have potentially split that up into two um, and kind of estimated the hours for each um, separate um, to to really help understand the, the kind of because they're two completely different experiences, right? Yeah. One being a nanny, one being a caretaker. So uh, very interesting there. Uh, and again, um, this one is a little bit more of a, of a job description one. So this is a good kind of uh, to contrast the writing and the other experiences. This one is a little bit more job description. On Friday evenings, I did this, I did that, here's what I did, right here I was responsible for X, Y, Z. So okay. potentially could have told a story here, but you didn't and that's that's okay. Because um, your other ones you did. So it's, uh, it's a good, interesting thing. Is, is there a reason why you didn't try to tell a story with this one? I did in my um, personal statement from this one, so. Okay. And I think maybe I maybe thought they wouldn't. I don't remember, but okay. maybe I thought they wouldn't know what that job was exactly. Okay, makes sense. Um, all right, and then nanny here as as another experience. Uh, obviously, um, a full time job there for you, and uh, again storytelling for this one, which is great. So, good job. Yeah, but that one I like. They definitely know what just a normal nanny is. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, they do. Uh, again, hopefully they do. They, they should. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, again, this experience here, um, uh, a radiologist who is disabled and uh, what you did for the radiologist and, and kind of a little bit of the... Um, a little bit of a job description kind of thing here, probably the same kind of reason. What what exactly is a helper? What are you doing? And so you're you're trying to explain that a little bit more. Um, talk about you 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 told me before we hit record that these experiences came up in at least one of your interviews. Why do you think these stood out for for the person interviewing you? So she asked me um, about it, and I think she was trying to ask like, is this a special interest of mine or? Like, because I had the two separate experiences, um, I think she was trying to, like, get something more. But it really, like, for me just happened. Um, and so when she asked me why, I don't know that I gave the best response because I was like, well, I was working as a nanny and I needed another nanny job. And, like, I happened to be her caregiver. Um, and then when I went to my post back and I, I found that. But so the helper for the radiologist, I mean, it was also kind of shadowing, too. So that was, like, mm -hmm. really cool for me. Um, 
because I got to be side by side with a radiologist and that was awesome. And I, I just happened to also be his helper. So yeah, I don't know what just happened, but she was, I think she was, what she was trying to get at is like, is this a special interest or passion of yours? And I was like, yeah, oh, really? It yeah. just happened. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Just, just happenstance to, to have two very similar people. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, lab technician going back a couple years. Uh, again, looks like a full time ish job based on the total hours that you have here. Um, and the um, the the story here that you talked about not really a story, a little bit more of the the experience and and even uh, why you um, why why it wasn't the best experience for you because it lacked that clinical experience that you wanted the the patient contact that you wanted um mm-hmm. i don't know if i would have put that in there right I, I like talking about not focusing on the negative right the to to me that that really takes away from the experience of you just saying like here's what i did and i didn't like it <laughs> right and so yeah. um so I, I probably would have avoided talking about that but the rest yeah. of it pretty good um research here so you got some research again everyone is worried about research but you got a little bit there which is good um what you did so good job with that extracurriculars chemistry club some hours there um a little bit of story here (laughs) talking about gummy bears which is good um so really good kind of uh well-rounded application in terms of experiences and lots of variety of things, some research, some, some volunteering, uh, good amount of clinical experience, good amount of shadowing. Again, I, I really like just listing shadowing like this, um, because shadowing typically isn't that impactful. So good job with that. Um, again, storytelling here, um, right, right off the bat, I can see that you're telling a story and what that, that looked like. So good job. Um, all right. And then we get some more. Um, so lots and lots of clinical experience, which is great. Shows you're, um, you're out there trying to get that experience again, more storytelling, which is great. I just, I love that. Your videos on that was super helpful. (laughs) Good. Because you had the examples and I was just like sitting there stuck when I was trying to fill this out. And I just went through each example and paused like each um, one that you had. And it just like helped spark my Mm. thought process. And it was just, yeah, it was really helpful. Good, good. Um, uh, Again, being a server, a lot of a lot of students make the mistake of not putting this kind of experience on an application because they're like, well, it's not related to medicine, and and that's what the application is for. But it really highlights uh, other things that are going on in your life, things that are taking up time and and taking away from other things. And so, um, I'm I'm glad you you put this stuff in here as well. And then, um, uh. Again, the the stories and right the aroma of the sandwich <laughs> reminded me <laughs> of my hunger. I, just that kind of writing, I'm just like, oh, it's like it's just such a change from from students trying to sell themselves. So, uh, really good job. Um, you didn't try to uh, just glancing at this. You doesn't look like you tried to talk about how. Um, being a server helped you with your time management skills and, and working under pressure and uh, customer service skills and communication. I I don't need to know that. I think the the far majority of people out there understand what a server does, understands that there are uh, good customers and bad customers. And you're dealing with all of those people and, and communicating with all of those people and, and dealing with the stress. Like I understand all of that just from you being a server. I don't need you to reiterate that in your description. Tell me who you are in your description. So good job with that. Um, The equestrian team, obviously lots of hours here um, that you added. The the breakdown of hours like that, I typically don't recommend because I've heard issues of students where 
what the school gets. So the, the school doesn't see a PDF like this. So the school sees data points, uh, oh. all the data that you put in. And I've seen issues where the school only gets the top one and they don't see anything else. Oh. And so uh, for the, the, obviously you're leaving out the summers um, and, and doing just year by year by year, I would have just done 8 2013 to 5 2017, 2000 hours done um, oh. just to make sure there's no, no issues. It's, yeah. it, it's not going to come down to like, Oh, like it looks like you're lying here in your total hours because you really weren't on the equestrian team during the summer. Like it, that, that kind of stuff isn't going to come up. So, um, uh, I love again, storytelling. I, I, I can't reiterate it and talk about it enough. Just your writing style, what you're focusing on here is is good because it's not focused on you trying to sell yourself and you focus on here's what a physician needs to be here's what i am i match that therefore you should accept me so great <laughs> great job <clears throat> and and you didn't try to connect it to right being on the equestrian team being uh being the team captain you didn't try to then connect it to this will help me be a physician because which is great. You don't need to. I think I did on my first application. If you read that essay, you'd probably want to cringe. <laughs> ball it up. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's why that's why we learn from our mistakes and we we learn different ways of doing things. And it's great. Um, so just a really, really good job all around uh, in terms of types of activities, the way that you're writing about your activities and, and everything else. So good job with that. All right, and then we get to your personal statement. And so let's go ahead and dive in, take a look at that. So right off the bat, again, I just, I know hopefully that I'm going to enjoy it because I see showing, not telling right off the bat. A lot of students start off a personal statement with the very cliche, I've always wanted to be a doctor since. <laughs> it's like, no, as soon as I read those words, I'm like, no, this is going to be horrible. Please, please don't torture me. Um, and so you start off, right? The sound of an aircraft flying towards us, cut through the silence. Like, I'm just like, yes, I can picture that. I can hear it. This is engaging. I want to keep going. I look out of the passenger seat window and see the helicopter we have been waiting for. Awesome. Approaching the helipad, it seemed as though a single gust of wind could drastically change its trajectory, right? It's just, uh, you're, you're obviously not talking about medicine at this point. You're not talking about why you want to be a doctor. You're, you're setting the scene for someone and, and really helping them engage their senses. I can see it. I can hear it. I can feel the wind. Um, and so just really good job with all of this. Um, uh, the flight crew meets us there uh, with their critical patient. So, oh, this is a clinical experience. Great, what's going on here? Um, you you have just this story of wheeling the patient to the emergency department, and then what? Why was this important? Why are you telling it to me? Right? I wished I could heal the emotional and physical pain that had caused this injury to occur. Uh, occur. Right? You're you're talking about this story. You're talking about this specific anecdote this patient going here's what i did but i like i wanted to do more I, I and and it sounds cliche to say that but that's such a, a common feeling and sensation especially for pre-meds as they're going through this journey to to know that everything they're doing is cool it's exciting it's it's what you it's part of what you want to be doing but it's not enough right yeah and so really good really good setup here for this story and uh, I, I really like the, the focus here, solidified my decision to continue pursuing a career as a physician. So in, in my personal statement book, I, I talk about the seed and then what watered the seed. And so a lot of students think that you have to talk about the seed first, but potentially it looks like here without reading the rest of it, this is not your seed, this is a watering of the seed, um, mm -hmm. but it's a good story and so you led with it to kind of hook the person in. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we go on, um, you uh, you have another patient encounter here, and and what you are uh, what you're focused on, um, and then you get into a little bit of your seed here. Um, 
of of what you think a doctor is and and where it goes. Um, how much of uh, and it, it's I, I'm interested in it for a couple of reasons. But one one thing I didn't really focus on was at the beginning where um, in your application you um, you identify as as black, correct? Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that um, in when when I glance at your application in terms of like what this perfect applicant has to be, this perfect student to or person for for medicine of of being the straight A's, right? How much potentially of that was also I didn't really see a lot of black doctors, so I, yeah, I didn't um, know. One hundred percent. Um, I mean, not even that for me growing up. Like I didn't see a lot of doctors. Period. Like I was very healthy as a kid. I didn't have anyone sick in my family. Like. I only went to the doctor's office occasionally to get a physical to do track. And that was like a white male doctor. And that's my only, that's it. And then I know one other doctor growing up was like somebody I went to high school with. Her dad was a doctor. Like that's it. (laughs) Yeah. So I really was not exposed to medicine hardly at all. Yeah. And it's, it's such a common story that I hear all the time from, from underrepresented students of starting this journey a little bit later and not, not believing in themselves or not being motivated to go down this path and not believing uh, in, in this path because they just, they didn't see that representation of, of who they were. And so it's actually a, a project that, that we're in the process of working on called pre-med mentors where um, we go and get those stories from, from black and, and Muslim physicians and um it just a wide variety of, of different upbringings, different disadvantages, different uh, underrepresented minorities who tell their stories as physicians of how they got there and um, to hopefully let students like yourself and, and other students in the future go, I've never seen a physician who looks like me, who's from the same place as me, from the same neighborhood as me, uh, but this physician in this in this book or, or wherever we, we put it out that's, that's like me and they did it. So I can do it. So, yeah, uh, that's really cool. All right. So, uh, you, you have this story. It's interesting. Um, the, the way that you went about going about telling the story of your seed, yeah. uh, it's very interesting and I like it. It's like, here's my seed, but it's a story of this conversation I had. Yeah. Um, and, and so I really like how you, how you did it. And, and I wonder, <clears throat> I wonder if you went about that in, in this way, because maybe your seed wasn't this like aha moment of like, Oh, like my, my mom had cancer or like I broke my leg and, and et cetera, et cetera. And so I wonder if you felt the need to, to kind of change it up a little bit because it wasn't as interesting as you, you think maybe it needed to be. Yeah, I think that's pretty uh, accurate. I just like those two sentences that I put in there, I don't know how I could have made that like a paragraph. And I feel like if I had, it would have been kind of cliche. Like, I like you say, avoid saying I like science. And I want to help people. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. And like, it just happened. I had that conversation. Um, so I don't know. It just happened that way. (laughs) Yeah. Good. Okay. I think it, I think it worked well. Um, um, a little bit of the, a, a different takeaway here that I typically don't recommend, right. Reminds me not to take patients trust for granted, right? Great. That's true. And why is that important to you and your, your journey here? Um, so that's, that's okay. Not, uh, not, uh, a killer for a personal statement. Everything looks good so far. And so you, you have this, uh, story here continuing on going through, uh, seeing more impact here, what you're experiencing, um, again, telling the story, placing a catheter, shower, dresser, preparing the kids, right? So you're talking about the mom here and, and being a nanny. And um, love seeing how impacting her quality of life uh, strengthen your determination to become a physician, right? So what's that takeaway? Why is this important to you? What, what is so um, special about this? Um, oh, look, <laughs> who look like me? So see, I, I just, 
I, I've done this once or twice, so I, I can understand what, you, what people are saying. Um, so talking about right growing up, really seeing people who look like me, um, and so you get that later start. You rode horses, which again is not um, uh, is not a very diverse field either. It's a very privileged uh, sport. Uh, equestrian is is a very privileged sport, um, and so. Uh, not wanting to be a, a physician until after you graduated, meeting meeting a physician uh, after you graduate who was an African American woman, um, and then going on to this this story of of what you're doing and and why you're doing it, um, and and specifically talking about inspiring kids uh, potentially who look like you in the future, letting them know that this is what you want to do. So um, I think you did a a good job. Um, with the personal statement, especially at the beginning, telling that story, I think maybe you trailed off a little bit in in what this was about at the end with kind of your takeaway, um, because you can definitely uh, be a mentor for others who look like you, come from the same place as you outside of medicine. Um, so a little bit of a distraction, I think, but I think at the end of the day, obviously good enough and and much better than a lot of personal statements. So good job with that. And one of the sentences in my interviews he pulled out from that paragraph, he asked me to explain um, if you do not see something that represented a society, you assume it's not possible. So I got to kind of talk about that in my interviews and that was a cool thing to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's right. That's that's the whole motivation behind this pre-med mentors uh, project that we're working on. So um, you, you have to, you have to see it to realize it. Um, it, it's possible. There's a saying in medicine, uh, as you go through medicine, that you can't diagnose something you, you haven't seen. Um, and so uh, when when you're going through training, all of that training, all of those hours working are are there, are meant to expose you to as many things as possible. Because when you're out on your own practicing, and a patient comes along who has an abnormal presentation, well, guess what? Like patients don't stick to the the textbooks, unfortunately, and you have this patient with an abnormal presentation, if you haven't seen that in your residency, in your training as a, as a third or fourth year student, that's not going to come to mind when you're building your differential diagnosis. So it's kind of the same thing, right? Both both in your life journey as a, as a person of color, not seeing another person of color um, in the role potentially that you want it to be in. And so you're like, well, maybe it's not possible. It's not meant for me. Uh, but the same thing in medicine of like, I, I can't diagnose this. I've never seen it. I don't understand it. And so um, it's, it's very similar kind of correlation there. Talk about your, your school list. You, you build a, a school list here, 26 schools. You, you mentioned uh, only applying to four the first time around. Uh, but but building a much bigger school list this time. Why so many schools the second time around? Um, well, it was a little easier. I got the fee assistance program, so okay. I didn't have to worry about how much it cost. So I wanted to apply a lot because my one mistake last time was only applying to four. Um, and I wanted to apply to some reach schools, like areas like the University of Arizona, like I'm probably not going to get into that public state school, but I would love to live in Arizona yeah. um, and then find a handful of seemingly realistic, even though it's kind of hard to really determine, even if you use the MSAR. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to cast a wide net. And I also applied to four DM or four or five geo schools. Okay. Uh, and obviously very successful, application cycle for you at the end of the day what do you think it was that that put you over the top this time around i think it was kind of just putting all the pieces together like just applying early having the experiences that i had telling my stories um also like finishing my secondaries within two weeks um and just continuing to tell my stories during interviews yeah. uh, i did mock interview prep um and yeah, I just, everything like coming together, doing well in the MCAT. Um, I think it's just like a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would agree. I think, uh, obviously I don't have your, your first application here, but from what you're saying, it sounds like how you approach the application is completely different. Telling your story, both in your application and in your interviews 
it's it's just so impactful. Students just don't understand the importance of of letting the reviewers know who you are through your writing and through your your interviewing. Yeah. And I think the whole process of like coming up with those stories for your application almost kind of helps you for interviews because I remember small snippets of my first interview and like she asked me why medicine and I know my answer was terrible. Like I just didn't have that idea of like telling your story at all. I probably didn't even really know then. Yeah. And I remember stumbling on the question and like, I don't know. And like, finally (laughs) this time around, like when they asked me why medicine, like, I don't like, I feel like I had this idea that you have to say like one sentence that is like the best sentence in the world. And it sounds perfect. And this is why, but it's more like telling your story. So I like just start with, well, um, it started as picking my major because those classes were so cool. And then the following summer I shadowed and then I worked as an EMT and like, here's what I experienced as an EMT that I wish I like, it just helped me decide that I want to be a doctor even more now. And like, I just yeah. tell my story and I don't know, interviews are kind of fun when you get to just talk about yourself. And like, really <laughs> yeah, just- there's, there's no yeah. pressure, right? Yeah. When, when you're not trying to sell yourself and being perfect and, and yeah. really having that agenda, uh, it's it's such a battle every every day when I do mock interviews with students of of really getting them to shut that part of their brain off, of of trying to to sell why they're amazing and and um, just selling these small inconsequential experiences that that they've had in their life as this grand thing that showed them how important diversity and how important communication and how important empathy and all this stuff is to being a physician. I'm like, stop, just, just talk to me, just talk to me. Um, and, and they realize they're like, Oh, that was so much easier. I'm like, yeah, it is. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, that's very cool. I wonder, uh, I, I asked you earlier about your vet med experience. I, I bet you that it, even though you say you, you didn't pick your major until later and it was um, more a little bit more science related and then you shadowed, I, I bet you the experience with being around vets and being around horses was, was a big factor for you kind of, um, whether consciously or subconsciously exposing you to medicine, uh, obviously not human medicine, but, but vet medicine and seeing what, what the vet impacts could have on the animals and, and you having that in the back of your mind to, to eventually lead you down this path. Yeah, I think probably so. Like I think medicine in general is always like, yeah, like you said, like been intriguing, but maybe more subconscious like I didn't see myself as a doctor but it was definitely intriguing like growing up yeah well very cool I wish you the best of luck thank you so much for coming on sharing your your journey and your success uh on mission accepted here um good luck and and thank you again yeah thank you for having me this was awesome and it's really great to know that you like my stories because here's the advice that I got that from so it's great Good. You you listened. A, a lot of people read a lot of people read my books and listen to my videos and they still don't do a great job. But you did you did a really good job. So, good job. Thank you.